We never know where life will lead us or what may hinder us along the way. But while every day can feel like one big question mark, it doesn't have to. With the right insights, strategies, and solutions from Western and Southern Financial Group, together we can look ahead to leave the unknown behind. Mailbag season, baby. I love the mailbag episodes. We might have to do this year round. Like, I know. With, the, with as many people who are like interested in the mailbag, I think we might have to do this year round. Some people are asking Has to, to do mailbags every night, like just one on one mailbags. I don't know. Just me and you. You come over, light a candle. I don't know why a candle has to be the first thing, but something could be done. You know, I think a mailbag episode late night could be just nice. Just something to mask the smell of the place. The smell of the place is fine. That's fine. I know. It smells like coffee and hard work <laughs> and effort. Somebody on the YouTube hard channel said that sweat. they think you smell. It's that you look like you smell. Uh, I get that a lot, actually. <laughs> no, I, I didn't say that. It's just it's fine. No, it's fine. Out. All right, can we break here? <laughs> just kidding. Um, let's jump into the mailbag right off the bat here. Oh, I don't have any give stories. Some more deets on the the Pac-Man Jones. I got an update. On the you got an update Jones. on the Pac-Man yeah, so Jones Pac story. Pac-Man, he went on Pat McAfee's show that day, which is a wild decision on his part to, to hold that commitment start, is awesome. Yeah, to immediately start explaining what happened, and according to him, he said he was talking to the DJ. Uh, He's at the DJ booth at this bar, and all of a sudden, his buddy, or I guess his, his friend, started fighting with the bouncer. They had had previous beef with that bouncer from another bar, is what he said. Classic. And then he just kind of got roped in, is what he said. And when he gets roped in, he's going to finish it. What I heard from eyewitness accounts, he had been kicked out of that bar before. He was not allowed to go into this bar. Mind you, this bar is like two months old. Clutch. Damn. Down the street here. He is already banned, comes in, and when he came in, they stopped playing music. Like it's late on a Sunday night. There were not a ton of people there. They stopped playing music and they're like, you gotta go. Like they're, uh, everyone's there, you gotta go. And he's like screaming and yelling, like start playing the music. We're like, no, you're not kicking us out sort of thing. And that's when all hell broke loose after that. And that it was just like, he was the aggressor, allegedly in this case. And also allegedly had a gun. That is what I would count said, allegedly. Is this an ad so, for Clutch? Because you're getting me interested. I, I can't is, wait to go. <laughs> yeah, that's that's about that bar. Pac-Man Jones sounds like a riot. You know, I think he'd be a good time. I, I, we, got, we got to try and get him on the pod here. We'll try and get him on the pod. At Clutch, maybe. Who knows? Um, let's jump right into the mailbag here. Remember, if you want your questions answered on the mailbag, YouTube comments are hard to track. Instagram, Twitter, all that stuff. Like, I, I wish we could do that. Right now, we have so many coming through Apple Podcast Reviews. I encourage you to go do that. That's how you go. I just dropped my phone. Jesus. That's how you go get the um that's how you get your question answered yes. on the mailbag. That's how you get your question answered on the mailbag. Starting with Nick Merriam. Love you guys. Great show. Need to have you both on Boomer Bust, the draft podcast sometime. Again, Boomer Bust, fantastic podcast. A couple of young guys that are ripping it up, talking draft every single day, it feels like. Yeah. I see their content all the time. Um, I need a scouting breakdown of Austin Gale, Mike Renner, Beard Eye team. I'm guessing Austin's defense is a liability. Okay. If there is, go. if there's any liability about my game, it is not defense. I'm probably the best catcher of anybody that plays at your house. Like I, like that was a little too far. But you get what I'm saying. I, I, I have snags for days. If there's anything anyone says, like defense this is your strength. Good. Yeah, the defense is a strength, and I think my offense is damn good too. I'll say your liability is that is your tolerance. That I would agree. You get with. four games in. We did a best of seven last week on Saturday. You get by the end, it's kind of the game. We didn't talk to, about our best of seven. The game starts to decline. The best seven was great. We're down 10 So it was me and Ben Lindsay, who's another analyst here at PFF. Yeah. And we go up in the series 3-1. Yeah. Classic. And Gold you guys State start Warriors. to inch back. You guys start to crawl back. It gets to game seven. Ben and I sink three cups. In two seven. for me, one for him. It, we go up 10-3. 10 10 10-3 in game seven. I thought it was over. I thought the curtains were coming. Then you guys come back. Put I was off the pissed, gas dude. Took the and I think it was the beer tolerance that got me. I think another strength of my game, too, though, is the the trash talking. I had someone come up to me at the uh, when we were hanging out after that and say, you know, if you're mentally weak, like, I can't play with you. Like, I, I, I struggle. <laughs> and it's like, dude, it's all good, man. We're yeah. all just making jokes. But uh, the beer died team, we don't play together, together a ton because no. we don't want to just clean up. It would be too unfair. It, it's unfair. 
All right, jumping now to Al Lecce. Like this pot, Le- Lacey? AJ. AJ. Lecce. I don't know why I said Al. AJ Lecce. Lecce. This pod cakes my pants. Incredible. Resisted dipping into the college world for so long, and Austin Mike finally broke me. Learning so much on sifting through the hundreds of prospects blended with the intuitive PFF style and approach. A new offseason staple for me. Pod question. Can each of you give me one cake your pants fit for a prospect on both sides of the ball? What are your dream landing spots for some of the deeper, raw, or unpolished guys in this draft class? I'll do the cake your pants fit. Okay. Offensively, Kenneth Gainwell. Memphis running back, one of the best receiving backs in the entire class to the Bucs. I think that, like, Tom Brady did not really change his stripes this year. Yes, they went downfield a ton, but he was still pumping targets to guys who were not receiving backs. Like, he was still like, okay, I'm getting to my running back, getting to my running back. If you had a guy back there who's a legitimate threat as a receiver, which Kenneth Gainwell is, that would take that offense, not to another level, but, like, it would be a nice addition to that offense. Defensively, you can go Andre Sisco, the Syracuse safety that we love. Freak athlete, uh, four three speed. Unfortunately, a torn ACL. Unfortunately, just all over the place in the backs. Just he's just jumping routes left and right. Going to the Ravens though, where you can fit that guy in that scheme, uh, and just they cover so much ground on the back end that I would love to see what how they deploy him. So I think that's a cake my pants fit for sure. I, I have one. Can I add a bonus? Cake it. J.C. Horn of the Pats. I saw that in a mock draft recently. Yeah. We talked about that on the Wednesday yeah. episode. But, like, J.C. Horn of the Pats at 15 is an awesome fit. Maybe a reach by some people's big boards. But, man, I do think Bill Belichick could do wonders with that kid. With J.C. Jackson, maybe Stephon Gilmore leaving. I really do like J.C. Horn of the Patriots. Oh, man, I think you that got a awesome. J.C. and a J-A-Y-C-E-E. Oh, wow. J.C. J.C. That'd be wild. I, I, I will say this, too. I've been, I've been First contemplating sending this tweet out because, like, we're not able to share the we'll all-22. What is it? <laughs> we're not able to share the all 22 film that we get from colleges and stuff like that yeah. all the time. There's some areas where we can't, but I wanted to tweet something out along the lines of like the best games you've seen from certain prospects, like Tevin Jenkins versus Joseph Asai. And then you have JC Horn versus uh, Auburn. And some of the plays that you can get from those are just awesome, but like yeah. we can't share them. But JC Horn versus Auburn mm-hmm. is the reason he'll get drafted in the first round. Like how he shows up against Seth Williams is honestly incredible. Yeah. There's, oh, I wanted to tweet out a Travis Etienne had a double move. Lined up as a wide receiver. That was dope. But you can't see it from the yeah. game tape. Like in the There's also play. two Chris Olave routes against Patrick Sertan in that uh, championship where you're like, oh, buddy. Like I, I wanted to tweet those out too, but the All-22, uh, you hate to see it. You can't get it out there. All right, this is from B Flash. B Flash shall one. Rating five for five because this is an awesome podcast. And I got a massive question. With the Chiefs and Bucks going to the Super Bowl, people have been discussing the importance of elite offensive weapons. Tyreek and Kelsey for the Chiefs, Evans, Godwin, Brown for the Bucks. My question is, what team that doesn't exactly need a wide receiver or tight end should take one at the top? And who should they take? The idea is I love Devontae Smith somehow going to the Vikings and being paired with Jefferson. Yeah, we kind of talked about that. Jefferson won on the, or the Devontae Smith Vikings won on Yesterday's pod, I'll give, I say, 49ers and Falcons going to Kyle Pitts would be awesome. Now, Falcons probably not at four, but if they are one of the teams that flips back for a team needing a quarterback, Pitts is on the board, would love that. I put the I put Dallas in that conversation too. Dallas going Kyle Pitts with yeah. the weapons they have already yes. like would be freaking sick. Any of those teams go Kyle Pitts. Chargers, you had this one, Jalen Waddell. Now, I love my boy. Uh, names escaped me there. Other slot that Keenan Allen? About. No. Mike Williams? Okay. Oh, Guyton. Guyton. Jalen Guyton. Love my boy. But yeah, he's he's not Jalen Waddle. I, I know this. So that would be that would that could take that offense to another level. And I'll Kadarius Tony to the Chiefs is like the last one that's just like, oh man. Or Rondale to the Chiefs. Yeah, just something. One of those like gadgety types that is just gonna be so difficult to to stop in that offense. Or what what about another running back for the Chiefs? I think that could be the missing piece. All right, no more jokes. C I Gator O two. My favorite pod. Mike and Austin love the pod. Look forward to every episode that comes out. Love seeing you for five minutes on the Bachelor as well. (laughs) My question is, what do you think it would take for the Ravens to move up and grab Kyle Pitts? I know it's a long shot, but he would be a perfect weapon for Lamar and would make them the hashtag fun, most hashtag fun to watch team in the NFL. Thanks. Not really their MO. And it, it would take a lot. If you think back to 2018, the Saints who owned the 27th pick to move up to 14, they had to give up another first rounder. That's how much it took to move up that much. And that's – if Pitts is still on the – I don't think Pitts is still going to be on the board at 14. So you're going to have to go even higher than that. So you're talking about more than just a future first rounder. Not worth it. 
not worth it. Trading up for a non-quarterback is very dangerous. Yeah. Because you're going to have to get legitimately insane value yeah. for that player, especially if in this situation where you probably have to trade inside the top 10, that's going to take multiple first round picks, including the one you have at the back end. I, I think the Ravens should stay put or mm-hmm. trade, not probably not trade back because they are in this window yeah. here, but I think staying put is, is the better option than trading up for Kyle Pitts. Yeah, if Kyle Pitts is really slipping, like... It would Every blow team's going to be calling. Yeah, I was yeah. going to say, it would blow, blow my mind for him to even get to 14. All right. Cobbacy alumni. Whoa. I, I used to work at Cobbacy. Mike and Austin give the great analysis, and Quinn gets to speak when the Bengals come up. How do you value breakout age and other college analytics? Are there historical trends that show these metrics to be predictive? What's your opinion of guys like Diami Brown and Seth Williams, great breakouts and dominator ratings, versus a guy like Darius Tony, who didn't do much until his senior season? So dominator rating has been shown to be nearly as correlated to receiving production in the NFL as purely draft status. So it, it, it a dominator rating being how, how like a combination of how much you've produced at at what age. So that there is a statistical proven track record for some a stat like that. It is important to, if you're good at a younger age. That's more important than being good at a later age. Now, it's also not the end all be all. There are is still a skill set. And for a guy like Kadarius Tony, who a lot of that was injury and the fact that he was behind a lot of talented receivers at Florida who had like their whole receiving core drafted last season. That's also quarterback play wasn't that great. And that you know, and yeah, like and that's another Felipe factor. Frank's throwing him the football when he's the guy who wins underneath, and Felipe Franks can't hit a barn door underneath. That all matters. So I I think you have to find a reason why they didn't produce. If it's just because the guy physically wasn't that good back then, well, shit, that's a problem. Like if you're at uh, a school like North Carolina, where, where there's really realistically no one in front of you that should have been keeping you from the football field and you're not playing or not producing at a young age, then that's a problem. But Danny Brown, I, I'm a big fan of his. Obviously, he, we're super high on him. Seth Williams, not as much because that's not our type of wide receiver, the guys who are pure physicality type of wide receivers like there's he should have he should have been good at a young age because he was big at a young age like that was his yeah calling card there's nothing in his game necessarily that's going to then i say continue to improve at the nfl level like that you still have to value the skill set of each and now seth williams still like for a bigger wide receiver he's still competent but i just don't think his skill set's not one that we're going to cut him I'm a big Diami Brown fan. Recently talked to him that episode or that interview will air on a future episode. But um, we talked about kind of that, that the biggest knock on him is the route tree. You know, like he yeah. ran a very limited route tree and he admits to it on the interview and talks about like, hey, I'm still working these other routes. I'm still doing this every single day, trying to run other things. And I think I, you're going to unlock my full potential when you give me an extended route tree. And I, we, we brought up the comparison to Brandon Ayuk, who ran a very limited route tree at Arizona State and is now cutting the rug with the San Francisco 49ers, who is also a friend of the pot, by the way. But Diami Brown was awesome. He has some really good things to say about Daz Newsom, too, who originally was committed to UNC as a corner. Interesting. And then was moved to um, wide receiver receiver and stuff like that. But he's like a gadget player for them. All right, next one here. From Gal34 Money Sign. (laughs) Which 2021 top 16 pick or picks have the most volatility? Great podcast for in-depth discussion. Most importantly for me, every podcast is entertaining and stimulating. You might disagree with PFS football takes, but it's hard not to find Gail and Renner a likable duo. Entertaining and stimulating is in my Tinder bio. So I'm glad it's also reflected in the podcast. You guys are like living, breathing, smelling salts. I was going to say that's the only review that's called you stimulating, though. What the hell is this? (laughs) You guys are targeting my beard eye defense, which is good. I am stimulating. Either way, answer the question. Top 2016 picks that are most volatile. Top top 16 pick. I, I think Trey Lance, obviously. Very volatile. This range of outcomes. Caleb Farley. From what we saw on his tape, it's just going to be his role at the NFL is going to be very different, and we haven't seen him play for a year. And then I think whichever edge rusher does go in the top 16, I think one probably will. It's just a very volatile class. Like These guys haven't put it together yet. There's no polished product. Like The guy's got a long way to go once he gets in the league, and not everyone gets there. Like mm-hmm. There are, for every you know guy that figures it out, there's a guy like There's Vernon like Golston. five guys that don't. Yeah, they're like Vernon Golston, who just like, it never happened. I definitely think the edge, the edge is the big one. You know, like yep. Philip, even the guys we really like, Phillips, Pay, Owe, um, Rousseau, all of those guys have boomer bust qualities to their game that yeah. um, are obviously very nerve wracking when you're drafting them high in 
um, the first round. All right, from David6981. Huge Jax fan. What are your thoughts on Jax using cap sla- cap space slash draft capital to trade for solid veterans with favorable contracts who might be facing a release by teams with cap issues? Say, moving our fifths for potential cap casualties like Poyer, Jordan Poyer and Greedy Jarrett. The thing is, there's so much talent that's going to be available for somewhat cheap for no draft capital. Mm-hmm. You know? Like... If they are true blue chip type of guys, Ryan Ramchick, I'd put Grady Jarrett in that category of like, that's an elite talent that doesn't hit free agency every now and then. Sure, by all means, I go ahead and get that. But like, there are, will be guys on this free agent market who are very good, better than what the Jaguars have starting, at least on the defensive side of the ball, that you won't have to give up any draft pick at all. So that's what I'll say. I'll say if it's, if it's a true difference maker that is, you know, Marshawn Lattimore. Ryan Ramchick, Grady Jarrett, in that mold of that guy you're just never going to find on the free agent market by all means. But I think that you'd be better served with where you're at and trying to build with young talent, cheap talent around Trevor Lawrence to to kind of extend that window, not just for this next season. I think the NFL just mentioned that the salary cap in 2021 will be a minimum of $180 million. I think yeah. they're still working out what the maximum will be. But I think Chase Edmonds, the running back for Arizona Cardinals, sent out a tweet, I think yesterday or the day before, about the, the offseason. He said there's going to be, and I think this is true. Super teams. Yeah, there's going to be a ton of teams or a ton of players taking one-year deals because they don't want a multi-year contract with this uh, you know, a, um, shortened salary cap and stuff like that. So I think you could see a lot of talented players who maybe in a normal offseason would take a three- or a five-year deal, take a one-year deal. And that's where the Jacks can thrive. Like bringing in guys on one-year deals that don't you know, hurt you long-term and you can weigh things out, I think that's the move for them in free agency. Mm-hmm. It's a move for every team. I'd be signing a ton of like really good talents to one-year deals. Well, and a that's lot of why... Guys- I think he said in that tweet that there's going to be super teams because if you're signing a one-year deal, you want to be on a team that's going to showcase yes. your talents. You don't want to be sitting at home in January. You want to be making a deep playoff run so everyone sees you. All right. This is from DCW2252. Best draft pod out there. Huge fan. Also a huge fan of the Dallas Cowboys. If both Farley and Sertan are off the board at 10, where do the Cowboys go? Also, putting on my tinfoil hat, is there a world out there where the Cowboys tag and trade Dak and trade picks for for Deshaun Watson. Ooh, love that tinfoil hat. I'm, I don't think I'm that's a tinfoil world. hat. I, I think that's live, a freaking straightforward yeah, hat. I still world. think the tag and trade is a more of an option for the Cowboys than people are giving credit for. Yeah, I think it's a very realistic option because you have so much talent there offensively and you have so much guys that so so many guys that you have paid a lot of money to already and you only have $19 million in cap space right now. So to tag Dak, if you can't get a deal done, that's going to be what, 30 plus million against the cap to get that? Probably 35 plus million. Yeah. To, for the one year. Uh-oh. So you got to create 16 million this one year to fit tack under. And like, is your window right now? You have a lot of you know young talent offensively. You want that window to continue in the future if you're not going to be able to sign Dak. So I, I thought Sam had the take on Instagram that Russell Wilson's not going to find better talent than what he has in Seattle. If he goes to Dallas, if there's a tag and trade for Russell Wilson even, that could give him better talent there. And I think that that's really the only way I see a guy like Russell Wilson or Deshaun Watson getting moved is if they get another legit quarterback in return. Now, God, Dak would like shit his pants if he got traded to the Houston Texans. He would probably like I would cry hate, himself to sleep. Yeah. Oh my God, I would hate that. But uh, he he wouldn't be able to get tagged again, and they'd probably just walk after one more year. So, man, that is such an interesting situation. I think it's been an underrated or under discussed situation this offseason like Dak Prescott is like there's this assumption that he's re- re-signing with Cowboys that. signing this monster deal but like that there, there was a legitimate conversation to this tag and trade idea if they, they want to go make a move for Watson want to go make a move for Russell Wilson um I think that's going to be very interesting okay so no far less or tan on the board at 10 where do the Cowboys go dream Kyle Pitts and then I would pro- I would go Micah Parsons because yes like linebacker not the biggest need there defensively but Jalen Smith's contract is a little bloated could be a cap casualty, maybe not this year, maybe next year. Lane Van Der Esch has obviously had injury history throughout his career. He's the best defensive player. And you're, again, I, I think I said, like your window is probably not this upcoming year. It might be, but I think you want to look a little more down the road. So him, maybe pay, maybe bar more. I could see at 10. I wouldn't hate it if you went that route, but I would go Pitts or Parsons. I'd be confident saying Micah Parsons is the best run defender 
we've seen in five plus years. I, I mean, watching his tape back against That's Memphis in the yeah. 2019 bowl game, and you see Monster. his fits and his sideline to sideline mobility. Like this guy takes on blocks well. And obviously, you can't, you don't want to overvalue run defense, but I think his floor is so high for his ability to play the run, his ability to kind of step up and play that box defender at an elite level. I'm excited for Micah Parsons in the NFL. All right, moving to Lar Balls. Renner needs his own show. If the Cowboys sign a free safety with a range with range to play in Quinn's cover three heavy scheme and re-sign a Wouzier to pair with Diggs, do you think they take Kyle Pitts or offensive tackle or still go defense? And if they take a linebacker in rounds two or three, who would you see there for them? I think they'll go Pitts. Like Jerry Jones loves him. That splash pick. Loves him a name. So do I. Kyle, Pitt, Kyle Pitts is the name there if you are picking at 10. So... And, and you're not going you know, defensive side of the ball. Linebacker round two, the dream would be Nick Bolton. And if 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 he's not there on the board, I wouldn't even go to linebacker. Like, as much as I kind of just shit on Jalen Smith and Lane Van Der Esch, they've played good football before. You don't have to force that linebacker fit. And that's why I was kind of saying with Michael Parsons, just because he's the best player. And it is better, in my opinion, than Jalen Smith and Lane Van Der Esch. But, like, we've seen... You don't need great linebackers to win on defense in the NFL. The Rams just had maybe one of the worst linebacker cores in the NFL and had the best defense. So not that necessary. What about Zayvon Collins falling in round two? Would that be an option for them? I I wouldn't. I probably wouldn't do it. Not with uh, what's his face his scheme. Dan Quinn's it's cover three. I don't think he's a great fit. All right. Mike is a COVID idiot. Is there any proof that you can't get coronavirus twice? Who are some of your favorite day three sleepers in the secondary? The juxtaposition between the two yeah. questions. And this is from Swag Daddy 42, a, a big fan of the pod, obviously. Is there Swag any Daddy. proof that you can't get coronavirus twice? Um, there's proof that you can, but there is. So, okay. This is probably in relation to me saying I couldn't give it to people down in Mobile. Yeah. Um, I have not actually done this research, but as we've talked about, my dad is a doctor. I didn't see him for six months uh because he's at risk after coronavirus hit and whatever. And he had a lot of free time. He didn't go out in public. They didn't, my mom and dad don't do anything uh, after coronavirus hit. They've just been at home. He's had a lot of time in his hands to research this. So he has done this research as a former doctor. My brother has done this research as a doctor and his wife is also a doctor. Um, what the hell is this? Is this fucking an episode of ER? Your entire family are doctors dude, and you're just some lot, random draft analyst? We do talk a lot about medicine <laughs> and injuries and stuff like that in our family group chat. But... <laughs> They've done a lot of research on this, and it behaves. The reason why they got a vaccine so quickly is because it behaves like other coronaviruses. They had this vaccine already made for another coronavirus. It took a small tweak to then put into, uh, what should we call it, testing. Uh, that's not the right word. Put into trials. There's, that's a better word. To put into trials because while it's more viral and deadlier, the immunity you get from getting it is like other coronaviruses and so it behaves like that in terms of after you have the antibodies your body has an antibody response for likely up to two years they think with this and that you are very 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 unlikely it's more it's better to have had it they think than to even get a vaccine but it's like better to get both then still a covid idiot in my opinion who are some day okay. sleepers and day three tired of this conversation in the secondary uh tay gallon we've mentioned a lot the ucf guy i think he I don't know where he comes off the board. I've not really heard anyone talk about him, but a fast cornerback. The other guy I like a lot is Trill Williams from Syracuse because I think he played out of position. He was playing the slot there, and it was a very physical slot, but he's not an instinctual zone corner that can win from the slot. He is a long, fast, explosive outside cornerback. And I think that's where he'll, he'll end up in the NFL. And it's always he's one of those. He's also a pretty freaky athlete. Like, yeah. He's a, he's a dude. And that's why it's one of those where. Kind of like LeJarrius Sneed. He played safety at Louisiana Tech is last year. And everyone's like, well, shit, he's not a safety. So we don't know what he's going to look like. But when you don't know what a guy is going to look like, he's playing at Louisiana Tech, which is probably a better program than Syracuse. Sorry. Wow. The bus guys. I mean, and so he's just a physical projection now, but he has the physical tools that can win at outside cornerback. Similar with Robert Rochelle, the Central Arkansas guy. Day three is an interesting pick at that point because he's so physically freaky ridiculous wingspan four three speed and then on two safeties obviously our dearest washington he might not come off the board until third the uh, fourth round because he's so small round, so small that it's just not gonna be for everybody and then christian Uphoff, the illinois state safety 
He's just a very good athlete. Very, very solid all around movement skills. Obviously coming from ISU, you're not going to get a ton of pub. Didn't even play this last year, but I think that guy, I think he can be a versatile safety. If you're getting him in the fourth round, I would love that. Chris Brown's fan 090909. What do you think the Browns will slash should do in the draft? Why does everybody have us taking a linebacker? Seems like we could solve more problems with a safety or defensive end. Or Darius Washington to the Browns? Okay. He likes our Darius. Hell yeah. Hell yeah, our Darius Washington the Browns. But I think everyone has to take a linebacker because someone's going to take a linebacker and they have a need at linebacker. And everyone wants to fill a need so they yeah. don't get yelled at. Mm-hmm. I've, I've done this before. It happens. You, you don't want the – you don't want to – it, it hurts a little when you get worst mock ever in response to your mock. It, it really does, does hurt. Every time, every single time. So you try to you try to fit a need when, honestly, I don't think they will. I don't think the Browns will. I think Andrew Barry can understand the positional value and positional scarcity in this draft class and likely go, at, I, I think they're likely very likely to go edge if they don't sign like a J.J. Watt or something. Pair him up with Miles Garrett. That would be... That yeah. would be pretty sweet. And I know the Browns are one of the favorites to land, or the Browns and Bills are like the favorites right now to land J.J. Watt. Uh, Carson He's Wentz, the by the way, according to He's FanDuel Sportsbook, according to FanDuel Sportsbook, yeah. Carson Wentz is minus 400 to go to the Colts. Right yeah, now, minus four hundred. Well, because he's like four, he's shoehorning himself there. He doesn't want to go to the Bears. Yeah, saying. apparently he doesn't want to go to the Bears. Well, I mean, can't blame him to be I honest. Either, yeah. yeah. Uh, Chicago kind of sucks this time of year. All right, come for the personal well, stories. Stay, worse, stay for the draft coverage. I fell in love with the draft process last year during the pandemic, and ever since have been looking for more and more content. I'm glad I found this one. Mike and Austin provide great information on prospects and teams while also sharing hilarious personal stories. My question is. Are the Cowboys a couple picks away from just having a decent defense so the offense doesn't have to score 30-plus points a game? Would personally like a second cornerback, a run-stuffing nose tackle, and a safety who can immediately come in and contribute. Same. I love Ardarius Washington and think he's in the conversation for safety one in this draft. Hell yeah. I don't Dude, care that he's 5'8". Thanks for the content. Our fans. That's love why there are fans. Ardarius. All right. I am of the opinion, and he said, you know, we'd like two cornerbacks. I'm of the opinion that the worst defense in the NFL, even the worst one, is two cornerbacks away from being at least an average defense. Yeah. You get two good That's quarterbacks. You already you have a high, high floor when you have two quality players at those two positions. So, yes, I'd love two good cornerbacks too from them. I do think, though, so to get to that point, Bucks method. Yes. Throw resources. Day two, maybe not necessarily day one. If it, you know, if you don't, I, I would I would still go day one. I would if Caleb Farley is sitting on the board there, take Absolutely. Caleb Farley as Cowboys fan. But, I mean, they, they went day two last year in Trayvon Diggs. Go again. And then again. And keep going until you've got those two or three quality cornerbacks, and then you have a high floor defense. And I also, like I said, a nose tackle. The two ones I'd feel really good about if I'm getting a nose tackle. And Kyle Shelvin, the LSU guy, I don't know where he's coming off the board, but he's about a sure thing in run defense as he gets if he can keep his weight under control. And then Bobby Brown, Texas A&M, probably more of like a fourth, fifth rounder. I think both those guys come in and – Two gap on the nose. And then that's fine. Not going to be pass rushers, but again, a position you don't necessarily need it. I think if they grab a cornerback in round one, whether it's Sertan or Caleb Farley, I think they'd be smart to pick up two more defensive backs on day two and day three. Even three more. Like, just keep throwing resources at defense back. Because there is a chance that Chidobe Awuzie does leave in free agency as well. And like, and you're in a position where you continue need, you need to continue to add resources in the secondary. All right, this is from Mike Renner 2.0. Your, your twin. Oh, man. Love the analysis and the personality you bring to the analysis of players and prospects I want to learn more about. Question. Do you think the Bills take ETN in the first round? Do you think the Bills taking ETN in the first round is a good move? Or do you think that they would be better off taking a corner or defensive end in the first and a running back like Javante Williams or Najee Harris in the second? Oh, no. 2.0. That's more like Mike Renner point two asking yeah, about running bad. backs. Come on. The, I... They just used back-to-back third-round picks on running backs. One, I still think Zach Moss is good. But if you, as a franchise, don't think Zach Moss and Devin Singletary are competent starting running backs, you got to almost admit you're bad at scouting running backs yeah. at that point. <laughs> like, you can't go back to the well for a third straight year. you got to just say, I've got to get a running back elsewhere. I'm of the opinion, though, that, again, Zach Moss is perfectly capable of carrying a load with a good offensive line in front of him. Go fix the offensive line first. Don't draft a goddamn running back until the sixth round, at least, if you're the Buffalo Bills this year. I think we're going to be having this conversation with the Bills, 
the Dolphins and the Steelers, like all all yeah. offseason, all leading up to the draft, like should they take a running back in the first? Should they target running back in the second? And I think all three of those teams, despite what your opinion of their running back talent is, would be better off taking a day three back or even an undrafted free agent before spending high draft capital at the position because I do think you can find value at that position later. That's been not necessarily scientifically proven, but in evidence has shown that you can grab guys like a James Robinson, like a Philip Lindsay, these guys that come off the board yeah. undrafted and can come and contribute. Like, I mean, that's it's you know, multiple teams have done it, and I think that's the move that they should I just, take. I just saw, I just forgot about this, but Devin Singletary was two picks for Terry McLaurin. Yikes. Zach Moss was three picks for Cameron Dantzler. Man. You'd be a little better off with Cameron Dantzler and Terry McLaurin. I agree. All right. This is from ZD hashtag 53. You guys definitely have the best draft slash young player analysis out there. Also combining the personal stories, add something different. Y'all feel like buddies whenever I turn your podcast on. We are buddies. Who are your buddy? <laughs> As mail, for the mailbag question, would you rather have the Lions trade up to go get Fields or Wilson or not spend the draft capital and get Trey Lance? So someone reached out to me on Instagram and said, why aren't people talking about the Detroit Lions potentially turning that draft capital they acquired from the Rams to mm-hmm. go move up and get a QB? And They're like, not a good team. That's why. They're not a good team <laughs> yeah. is, I think, the better answer. It's not because they have Jared Goff. It's because yeah. their team isn't good enough yet. And going up and trying to shoot the moon, trying to create this window with a field yeah. Jory Wilson, right now is probably a year too early. You're better off allocating picks and trying to build up a better roster. Because if they can go into 2022 with the top five pick, because Jared Goff doesn't play that well, but a, a handful of young players that are performing well, both offensively mm-hmm. and defensively, and they tag Aldo and all that stuff, like that, I think, is the move for the Detroit Lions. So here's the thing. To go up, like go up and get Justin Fields, say number three overall pick. They have to move from seven to three. We saw there was a kind of a precedent. The Jets to get to number three when they were going, going wanting, pining for Sam Darnold that year, 2018. They had to give up that number six overall pick and then two more second rounders. And when you're a bad team, second rounders are valuable picks still. That's picks 37, yeah. 38. Like those are those are picks that you should get quality starters still at that point in the draft. So if you're giving up two of those guys. Just to move up into that, when you're gonna, when chances are you're gonna suck and be in the conversation for one next year. That's that's too pricey to me, for me. Let Fair someone enough. else make that move. Pray one falls in your lap. That's what I would do. If and I then go bring Spencer Rattler or Sam Howell to Detroit. Exactly. Year. I like it. I like it. All right. This is from Zach three five two four. Great podcast. Religiously listen to every episode. Question is: Jets decide to go Wilson over trading for Watson. If the Jets decide to go Wilson over trading for Watson, what is Wilson's ceiling? Could he ever be an elite QB option in the NFL, or is his height and weight going to hold him back? Ceiling talk. Now, a lot of new listeners probably don't know our our aversion towards the word Disdain. upside. I don't say upside. I have, to, I have to make air quotes anytime I say it because no one knows what upside is. I added air quotes. No one knows because... It is a synonym for the guy's athletic. 9.9 times out of 10. No one raved about Richard Sherman's upside coming out. He was the best quarterback in the NFL for a handful of years. No one raved about Casey Hayward's upside coming out. He was undersized, not particularly fast. One of the best cornerbacks in the NFL at, at his peak. No one raved about DeAndre Hopkins' upside. No one raved about J.J. Watt's upside, Mitchell Schwartz's upside. These guys ended up being the best at their respective positions despite not having this quote-unquote upside because skill is still very much involved in the game of football at a lot of positions. It is not purely athleticism. So if you are a competent to above-average athlete, your upside, quote-unquote, can't be as good as it gets at your respective position in the NFL if you're skilled enough. And I think Zach Zach Wilson's traits are such that he could be the best in his position at the NFL. He has a live arm. He can throw on the run. He has accuracy that he's shown at a high level down the football field this past year at BYU. Will he get there? I mean, probably not. Not a lot of, like, it's rare that a guy puts it all together wholesale like someone like a Patrick Mahomes has, let's say. But I do think from a talent perspective, He's more than talented enough to be the best quarterback in the NFL. That's all. I think I think it that's is, what people are looking for, though. When when they hear yeah. upside, when they hear ceiling, they're like, could this guy at any point in his career be the best at his position? And there are some players where 
the probabilities of that are lower because they aren't these elite athletes or don't have these yeah. traits that translate to the NFL. But all all players or most players' range of outcomes, if you're getting drafted inside the yeah. top 50, top 75, have this range of outcome, whether it's like a 5% chance or a 0.05% yes. chance to okay. be the best player at the position, like Schwartz, like you said with Hopkins, Casey Hayward, and those things. I think with Zach Wilson, that probability is higher than it is for Mac Jones. Yeah. Can they both be the best at their position in the future? Absolutely. But the probability is higher because Zach Wilson has, like you said, the live arm, the accuracy, the athleticism, all these things yeah. that maybe Mac Jones doesn't yes. have. And that is what the conversation should be. It shouldn't yeah. be like, does he have more upside or is he? does he have a higher ceiling? Higher ceiling is also one of my least favorite things. Yeah, there's, there's one ceiling in the People NFL. People are going to talk about Felipe Frank ceiling. Like there's one ceiling in the NFL. It's, it's being that. the best, being the best at your position. Can he be that? Every player has a certain percentage outcome for that um, and all that stuff. The ceiling is the roof. Michael the, Jordan said that. The ceiling is the roof. And he knows. He was about the highest ceiling as it gets. Yeah. All right, from Carlos Magiel, best NFL draft pod on the market. I've learned much more, so much from Austin and Mike. Which players in the first round would have the widest range of outcomes in regards to landing spot? Love the pod. I think with this, the answer would be someone with a unique skill set that you're not going to find elsewhere in the draft, but also may not fit in with every team. Yeah. So someone could covet, and the guys I highlighted are Kadarius Toney, who is just different with the ball in his hands and after the catch than anyone you know we've seen in the past whatever decade or so of college football he's just a special guy in that regard but that's he's not a complete wide receiver so if you if you're fine with that and you're willing to put that in offense not everyone will be someone could draft him very highly because you're not going to get in the second round same with zavin collins i think a six foot four 260 pound linebacker that can run like a horse is a unicorn oh i can run like a unicorn that's better do unicorns fly no, that's Pegasus. Okay. Run like a unicorn. <laughs> the unicorns fly. That guy could go really highly because if you're sitting at 18 and you're the Miami Dolphins, you're not going to get a Zayvon Collins in the second round if that's a guy that fits in your scheme and you want that in your scheme. You're just not going to. So, but again, that's also a guy that might not fit in other schemes. So those two I'll highlight as guys with a wide range of outcomes. And then I think we've said this. We'll say this for a lot of answers, but the edge class is just all over the map that they could yeah. go the evaluations could be another player that I'd add to that, that I've seen mocked in the first round or con considered a better prospect than where we have him is Tutu Atwell. That's another guy where the yeah. range of outcomes is going to be bonkers depending on how he's used. Like it could be like, Oh man, he's getting peppered six to eight targets behind the line of scrimmage per game and actually getting utilized correctly or struggles to find the football field. Cause there isn't like a specified role for him in mm -hmm. an offense. I think that's another guy where I think there could be a pretty decent range of outcomes and sorry for laughing at, uh, at you about the unicorn thing. I think some unicorns probably could fly. I'm not deep in my, the unicorn game, I'll just say. Free draft guide to anybody that can tell us if unicorns fly, if you can prove that. Yeah, proof. True, if you can prove it. I need yeah. proof. I need we'll video get you a free proof. draft guide. Free draft guide. I'll give you more than a free draft guide. All right. Uh, very informative podcast, mailbag question. This is from Colin Meister. What are some early thoughts on Derek Stingley? People like to get on him for struggling versus Devontae Smith one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, I'm trying to read through this question. It seemed like he was put in some unfavorable positions against him. The check to sideline and press man coverage, late safety help. What are your thoughts, I guess, on Derek Stingley? He's stuck. Like, he's very good. He would be in the Caleb Farley slash Patrick Sertan conversation in this class for quarterback one. Six foot one, 194, and he ran 4'3 back in high school, and he's still only 19 years old. The stupid, the check with me, I think we put that on him coverage wise. I mean, it was on him coverage wise. We did not downgrade him for having to look to the sideline that was a fluke play that they caught him like they caught the defense they caught literally everyone on the lsu because that's what they're taught to do when the quarterback goes to the sidelines to look for a check so that play just throw it out whatever in terms of evaluation purposes the one he did lose later in the game i think was uglier that was worse obviously and on him for sure but he was there at the catch point kind of just lost so I, I think he's very good. Had injuries this past year, an ankle, which is maybe the worst injury to have for evaluation purposes because everyone plays through ankle injuries, but it just makes you worse. Yeah. Like I remember coming in, rolling into uh, regional semifinals in basketball my junior year on crutches into the guy sprained my ankle, I think three days prior. I'm on crutches going into the, into the uh, gym. And I played that game because you could tape up an ankle and put a brace on and not re-risk injuring it if you brace it enough. But I played like shit. I had no explosives. I couldn't turn the corner at all. I couldn't drive baseline because that ankle is still like toast. You got nothing from it, but you could play. And so I think 
his year this year wasn't as good, but if guys hamper an ankle injury like that, kind of throw it out the window. His freshman year was insane, though, for a freshman corner. Speaking of shit and explosiveness, didn't you poop your pants in a basketball game? Yeah, seventh grade. I was, it was not complete poop, <laughs> but you could see it was like risking that fart prior to the game. And then you could see <laughs> it on my shorts. Poop we're at home, hilarious. home white. Wish we were on the road. And then after that game, and then like everyone saw it, it was just like a little whatever on the back of my shorts. After that game, I got, I was like intent on never farting prior to a basketball game. The rest that's of my That's incredible. Career. I would never do it. That's incredible. Yeah. Oh my God, that's, that's funny. It wasn't complete Thanks poop, mom. All right. This is from Matt X Stevens. I listen faithfully to every episode and Austin, I love the stories. My question for you guys are, which Boston College draft prospect will be off the board first this year? And also... Does Phil Jerkovic look like a QB who has the tools that will entice NFL scouts? Didn't we get a Phil Jerkovic? We got we have, we have multiple Phil Jerkoviches. I think we got so that one already. The um, Jerkovic stands are loud and proud. He's good for a BC quarterback. I'll give him that. Yeah, but I don't think he's an NFL prospect. So I'm sorry. Okay, he's, he doesn't have for a big dude. He really doesn't have a great arm. Now he's athletic, but surprisingly not a strong arm. Hunter Long, though, the tight end, will be the first Boston College guy drafted feel very confident in that. I think he goes third round. He's a better prospect than guys like Devin Asiasi and Dalton Keene who win the third round last year at tight end position. So not that you can always do that year on year. Like every linebacker in this class is a better prospect than July and Tobias. That doesn't mean they're all going top 40. Fair. But I, I think the way the NFL kind of still values the position oddly high, I think he'll go third round. Saying every linebacker in this class is better than Jelani five was fucked up. Okay? okay, you don't have to do that to Jelani. Okay, that guy's just trying to make a make a play. All right, uh, this is from Jacob MR sixty five. Absolutely love the pod. As an Eagles fan, I would go be crazy not to notice how many holes we have on the roster. With the sixth pick, do you think they should go defense, Parsons or corner, or improve the wide receiver room? Then he has a mini question: If there was a top QB that fell to six, what would it take to get you to move down to pick them in the teens? Oh, oh, so he's saying if there's a QB that falls to six, should they trade down and yeah. let another team come up? And also would love a draft guide, so I appreciate all the background info and analysis. I will, I'll, can I take this question? Yeah. So I recently had the mock draft where they trade up and go grab a quarterback. I think the best option for the Philadelphia Eagles is to make an aggressive upgrade at the position, full stop. The second best option for them is to stay put at six or trade back to build around Jalen Hurts. And I think if they stay put at six, grabbing a big name wide receiver like Jamar Chase, Devontae Smith, Jalen Waddle is a hu- is a fantastic option. If they don't stay put at six, say a Lance falls them and they don't want to get in this quarterback group, then they trade back and add talent. But you saw yesterday multiple like Eagles reporters talking about how the Eagles want to get a quarterback in this class. Like they know that the yeah. position isn't good. Like it, again, it, this it is rocket take, science. That was my take immediately after the season was you don't intentionally lose week 17, whatever your thoughts, if they intentionally lost or not, but you don't care about draft position that much unless you're in the market for a quarterback. And And I think they are firmly in the market for a quarterback. Someone texted me saying they have two of the best quarterbacks in the NFL. I almost freaking threw my phone out the window. I don't get it. I don't get it. Like, take the Philadelphia cheesesteak out of your eyes and and, and look at the the, how well Hurts and Wentz played last year. It wasn't good. You can... You should not that you can do better than Jalen Hurts. Obviously, you can do better than Jalen Hurts. You should do better than Jalen Hurts if you want to win. Super exactly. Games. And the thing is, I think they drafted Hurts because of Wentz's injury history, because he has gotten hurt a lot, because having comp to back up has shown that, like, if you can win a few games, if he's injured for three or four weeks, still make the playoffs, that has a ton of value. So it, it does behoove you when you have a quarterback, like I said, with Wentz's injury history to have a backup plan that's viable. That was all that was, second-round pick. He was never, in my opinion, supposed to be the guy with Philadelphia. It was insurance. So and, and go and get the other thing the I'll add now. to that, too, because everyone says, well, let's just try it. Let's give Jalen Hurts 16 starts. Let's see what happens. If he's good, we stick around him. If he's not, he, you know, we, we move on next year. But you never know what's going to happen. That's the problem. Like, Jalen Hurts could fuck around and win six games, and next thing you know, you're drafting, like, eighth overall. And then you're in a position where, like, we can't get a quarterback, but he's shown enough. You know what situation you're in? The Broncos situation. Let's just give Drew Locke another throw. It's like, oh, damn, he's now we're picking ninth. We can't really get a quarterback. Yep. Well, let's give Drew Locke another chance. And then next thing you know, next year, say he makes some marginal improvements, which he probably should. He's, you know, getting more experience. And next thing you know, you're picking, like, 11th. It's like, oh, welcome to quarterback purgatory, the worst place to be in the NFL. Andy Dalton. Andy Dalton is another great example. Like, you, don't, you don't want to watch your quarterback marginally improve every year to a point where you're picking in the, the, the late teens. It you is need ins- a guy that can be transcendent. 
it is insane in retrospect to think about how stacked the 2015 Bengals were. Like that's one of the most that roster was insanely talented. Atkins where, like, in his prime, Dunlap in his prime. They had the, the Whitworth, Zeitler, AJ Green, Marvin Jones, Muhammad Marvin Sanu. Jones, Muhammad Sanu. Eifert. <laughs> and they gave. Hey, Eifert was carries. good that year. I know Eifert was Eifert good. Was a stud. Yeah. They gave 300 carries to, what's his face, though? Jeremy Hill. Jeremy Hill. Oh, man, the LSU back. That's right. Jeremy. All right, one, let's get back One to too many. We, we talk too much Eagles here. But again, uh, like, I don't know, man. I, and it's the same conversation I've had about Sam Darnold with Jets fans who, like, don't want to go quarterback, want to trade down and build around him. It's like, Sam Darnold improves by 100% next year. They maybe win eight games. And that's the worst place to be. And then you have to pay him on his second contract and all this stuff. Like, Sam Darnold is not, if he does improve like a Josh Allen-like leap in year four, it's not going to be enough, in my opinion, to make a deep postseason run. And like then you're going to have to pay him on a second deal, and you're in a worse spot than you were before. So, all right. Anyway, from Will Dog 37 I appreciate all the hard work. Assuming that the Eagles take a receiver in round one, which corner or linebacker would be a good fit for us in round two? Um, again, the receiver assumption here is a big assumption, but I'll, I'll go with it. I, I think another team where outside of Bolton falling, I'm not sure I really want to address. Got to go corner. I think I'd go corner, top of round two. And you got Jonathan Gannon, I was your defense coordinator, came over from Indy, so we learned under Matt Eberflus, but he also spent time, three years, I believe, in Minnesota under Mike Zimmer. So you have two, they're not similar philosophies. One's definitely a lot of quarters, split safeties in Mike Zimmer. One's a lot of spot drop zoning with Matt Eberflus. Going to the Eberflus method, they're, they've had, they have a type of corner. Long athletes. Greg Newsom, the Northwestern corner. Tyson Campbell, George corner. Ifitu Melfanu, Syracuse corner. Those are guys that would fit in that sort of system. Mike Simmer's a little different. He's gone with a lot of different body types over the course of his career. Um, I think he'd even throw Asante Samuel Jr. in the mix if you want to get a little frisky at that point. But not man corners is, I think, you're, what you're looking for. These definitely guys who have zone skill sets is what you're probably going to be running. I think corner makes the most sense, honestly, especially on day two. I think there's a ton of value at corner on day two. All right, let's jump now to Liam Tingley. This is from Love the Podcast and how you keep the content fresh throughout the year. I have two questions. Ah, love it. Um, first one is, is there any situation or what would it take in PFF's eyes for a defensive player to win NFL MVP? Interesting one. And then the second one is, what would recommendations? what recommendations would you give in order to work somewhere like PFF as an analyst and a writer? I'll take the I'll take second, second one. one. I'll take the first one here. Have you ever seen the movie Snowpiercer? No. Okay, so when I was visiting my parents, I was very bored. We watched the movie Snowpiercer. It's about they release some gas into the atmosphere to try to stop global warming, which also like Bill Gates suggested this just the other day too. He hasn't obviously seen Snowpiercer, and it, it covers the whole world in snow. That's what it would take for a defensive player to win <laughs> the MVP, the annihilation of the passing game altogether to where the quarterback is not the most valuable. So they're only, you can only run in the snow. It's snowing all the time. Passing game is dead. It's all triple option. Dude, then a running back wins. Derrick Henry wins when he gets like 2,500 yards. I mean, guy, like, it'd be very difficult for a defensive player to win MVP. Just, like very difficult. Yeah, so that's that's the only snow way. Snowpiercer effect, though. I, I'm happy to see it. The second one, and I just had a resume workshop with San Diego State via Zoom, and it got asked similar questions. I think the number one thing is to build a list of places that you want to work at, like ideally, like ESPN, The Athletic, PFF, wherever. And then consistently check their jobs pages, have them bookmarked. So that way you're not always looking through like an Indeed or a Glassdoor to find jobs. Yeah. Consistently check their jobs pages. The other thing, so everyone uses like LinkedIn to connect to people. And I'm like against this whole, like it's, it's about who you know and all that stuff. But like having that initial connection just for additional information can be helpful. I know a lot of people have reached out to me and said, hey, is PFF hiring? My response is, yeah, in May and June. Check the jobs page in May and June to be perfect. And then you have that perfect follow-up opportunity. Say like, hey, I saw that you guys have an opening. I just applied, say it's May or June. Hope to, you know, hope to work with you soon or something like that. That I think is the perfect way to apply to that job. In terms of skill sets to acquire, it depends obviously on the position, but I think adding skill sets in Excel, Tableau, any coding languages, Photoshop, all well, that Well, what stuff. I'll say is produce work. Yes. It's the single biggest thing you can do if you are a college student or whatever you're doing and have not worked in football or not currently working in football, and this is what you want to do, have work to point to. Start your, whether it's your own blog, working for a small-time blog, or Twitter. whatever it is. Yes, or just tweeting out takes 
analysis, that sort of thing. Start a video channel on YouTube. That's very free to do. Produce some work that you can point to and say, here's what I bring to the table because you're not alone in wanting to work football. A lot of people want to work football. There is a lot of people who just say, who love the game of football. It's the most popular fucking game on the planet, I think. It's more it popular is. than soccer. In my and opinion. you asked no. But like if, so a lot of people will come to you and say, I, you know, very passionate, I'll do this. Well, what can you do then yes. at that point? Yes. What, what are you bringing to the table? And if you have nothing to point to, if you've not done any work in it, well, shit. No, I agree. When I so. when I first started, I started my own website, thedraftpulse.com. I was writing for that and then wrote for other like free affiliate sites and that kind of stuff. But I think yeah, if you want to be to. a content creator, create some fucking content. Yeah. Like you need to start creating content, whether that's on your website, on your YouTube channel, or on your Twitter, start creating content. And no one's going to read it. No one's going to look at it. No one's going to give it the time of day. But you need to start doing it so that you can prepare yourself. And it will also make you better too. And it'll make you a lot better. Really Definitely well. when you start publishing your work and getting feedback, get feedback wherever you can is another thing. Mm -hmm. And you can get feedback very quickly on Twitter. You come out with a hot take like, you know, fucking um, Davis Mills is the best quarterback in this class. You're going to get some feedback. It's going to be worthwhile. You know, yeah. that I think is a very uh, good, good feedback from you. Uh, this is from Steeple Chase's Studios. Interesting. Love the incriminating family stories. Hey, don't make fun of the family. Only I make fun of the family here. They're not incriminating. These guys have done their time, all right? <laughs> My mom has done her time. My yeah, dad has done their they're time. They're already incriminated. They've already been incriminated. Anyway, uh, what three offseason moves would you like to see the Carolina Panthers make? All right. I would like them to re-sign Taylor Mouton or tag and trade at worst. He's a very, very good right tackle. Tag and trade at the freaking worst. If they just let him walk, it would be absurd. Yeah. I would like for them to cut Teddy Bridgewater. Do you know what sunk cost fallacy is, Austin? Yeah. That is a sunk cost fallacy right there. He is not your guy at quarterback. There is no reason to keep trying to shoehorn him into being the guy. There's no reason to kick the can one more year of him starting, even, even over whatever rookie quarterback you do get if you do get one. There's just no reason to have him on the roster. Bite the bullet, take the shitty cap hit this year, and don't push that into the future. So cut Teddy. Sorry, Teddy. And then, or if someone wants to trade for him, by I all means. I think you could get a trade for him. By all means. And then three, trade up for a quarterback. Find the guy that you like. Go get him. That's what I do with the Carolina Panthers. Yeah, I think the Carolina Panthers are going to be consistently mocked as a trade-up candidate, going to three or going to four to go grab a Zach Wilson, Justin Fields, or Trey Lance. Because, oh. Go ahead. I, because I do think that Teddy isn't the guy, and I think they realize that too. But I don't know if they'll go as far as cutting him. I think trading him would be the worst-case scenario because you do have a competent backup. And if they are going after Trey Lance, I think keeping Teddy – and having him start ahead of Lance until Lance is like get his feet wet and is ready to rock is, is another option they nope, can do. Nope, sunk cost fallacy. Okay. Let me explain sunk cost fallacy to people. You've already made the decision that you can't go back and undo decision. So you're only just a, you're only trying to justify it more by retaining it. You can only make that decision in this moment right now of what's best for your franchise. What's best for your franchise is the cap space, not Teddy Bridgewater starting for your quarterback. So go get the cap space. Sorry, you fucked up with the decision. I have a more approachable. I love the way you say sorry, by the way. It's like Canadian it's or whatever very the fuck Wisconsin. it is. But um, anyway, I have another like approachable way to think about the sunk cost fallacy. I hate this. When you go on vacation, what's the number thing you want to do? Eat. And there's times, though, where, okay, for me, it is. You know, you want to eat cool food in other places, Greece, Italy, whatever. If you go to a restaurant or you go to, you know, get food and it doesn't taste good, don't force yourself to eat it and then ruin that opportunity you have to get a meal, mm -hmm. you know, because, like, once you're full and you have, like, you, you've eaten it and it wasn't that great, you can't go out and grab another dinner. You know, hey, move on from this thing. You already mm -hmm. paid for it. Don't yeah. freaking try and justify it by eating it. Get out of there. I remember it happened. I was on a trip to Boston. We were trying to find these cool places. We found a place that got like an Indian place that served goat. It was horrendous. But I'm just <laughs> suffering my fucking way through it because I fucking paid a ton of money for it. But next That's thing you know, it's like, cost. that was my last meal in Boston and it sucked. You should have just thrown it in the trash and moved on and trying to go get something better. That's that's where I'm at with Teddy as well. <laughs> All right, uh, let's go PNW Betty. Love the podcast. It's a great way to learn about prospects in the up and coming draft and they don't sugarcoat their takes. They give you positives and negatives about everyone. Great way. Well, I'm going to move through the, you know, how much they love us. But um, mailbag question. Which offensive tackle into your offensive lineman would be the best fit for my Seattle Seahawks in the first round? And then the second question is, any thoughts on you dub tight end Cade Otten for next year's draft? Went to a high school with him, really. Would love to see him play on Sundays. Hmm. Okay. Uh, oh, shit. I didn't actually have the Cade Otten question answered. My bad. I will get the Cade Otten question. We'll keep that in for next week. Okay. Sorry about that. Sorry. The... OT IOL though, dream fits for the Seattle Seahawks. Praying for Walker Little, Stanford tackle. You're not getting a Walker Little at 
anywhere else in the second round, a guy that talented pretty much ever and any time in NFL history. So to get a guy that talented would be a dream scenario because of the absurd situation that he's in. And you're praying for Landon Dickerson. Because again, you're not getting the center that talented usually at that point in the second round. But torn ACL that late in the season, going to drop him down some boards. So those two, I would say, are your best bets. Sorry right. about the K-Dotten question. I'm next keeping week. K-Dotten in. I'm yep. keeping K-Dotten in for next week. All right, Dave and Chestnut Hill. When I win the Powerball and buy an NFL franchise, these guys will be my GM and we'll play beer pong during our meetings. I can't wait. That's going to be sick. That will be uh, sick. Why don't they measure how fast a quarterback can throw a football at the combine? In baseball evaluations, the speed of a pitcher's fastball is like a wide receiver 40 time, but no measurement for arm strength is odd. They do measure it, actually. Mm-hmm. But I believe, so no one uses it because it's trash. Because I think they measure it in the gauntlet drill, I want to say. Oh, and really? So you're throwing the gauntlet drill as the quarterback, and that's when they're measuring it, I think. Don't quote me on that. But they're throwing it in a situation where it's not you just rocking back and trying to throw as hard as you can. Mm-hmm. Like That's not what they're measuring. They're measuring it in just kind of like a game situation, maybe like throwing it out or something, to where some guys like to throw with touch, some guys like to throw with heat. Jared Goff measured at 57 miles per hour at the combine. Patrick Mahomes is 55. Sean Watson was 49. Oh, wow. That is not indicative of yeah, their yeah, respective yeah. arm strengths. So, again... They actually do measure. I wonder if it. an average would be better. You know, an average throughout the combine or something could. Or if be they better. just like had it, like it's a, a you drill. know a baseball game. You're yeah. At the 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 mat there with the fake receiver mm-hmm. with his hands open. You just got to whip it, and then they have the miles per hour just come up. Throw your shoulder out. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah this is hot. from Joey with like seven O's. And Joey, you two are goats. Love the pod and all that PFF does. Two questions. What is your guy's opinion of Jim Harbaugh? I personally think he's a great recruiter, but the offense he runs is so bad and predictable. I get competing with Ohio State is very hard, but even Michigan State has beat him a couple times since he's been there. I got I got takes on Jim Harbaugh. Trust me, Uh, I he is a fantastic recruiter, personality wise, running program. He brings in fucking talent. Michigan has produced a lot of NFL talent over his career. But I think he is 100% right in terms of schematically. You go back and look at what he did with San Francisco 49ers. His offense coordinator was Greg Roman. His defense coordinator was Vic Fangio. He had the best coordinator duo probably in the NFL. He recruited him. I mean, fuck. I mean, it's another example. He is, he is the cult of personality is real with him. Like, I, I would love to play for his program. Now, again, his offenses are brutal to watch because I don't think he's the quote-unquote offensive mind or quarterback whisperer that he was billed at. With San Francisco 49ers, that was Greg Roman. And now people shit on Greg Roman as passing offenses, but go look back at every single quarterback Greg Roman's ever had. They have all had career years and not been any career years with Greg Roman, not been anything else without Greg Roman. Colin Kaepernick. After Greg Roman, just off the face, like off the face of the earth in terms of production. You have Tyrod Taylor after Greg Roman, not even a starter in the NFL anymore. Lamar Jackson, rookie year, no Greg Roman. Can't pass worth a dime. Second year, wins the MVP. First year with Greg Roman. Now, are they simplistic passing offenses? Yes. But the man knows how to scheme a holistic approach to the offense that is quarterback friendly in terms of what it's asking them to do. And maybe Lamar Jackson would be great with someone else in a, scheming up that passing game. But Greg Roman's track record is pretty damn good. Second question from Joey here, and I appreciate the the Jim Harbaugh detail. I think that, yeah. that I think that would mirror a lot of people's takes. Yeah. Great recruiter, great personality, has not put it together from a schematic standpoint on the football field. And I also would say he has not developed this awesome talent he's brought in all that well. Sure. You know, I think the development of talent at Michigan has been a little bit of a concern, um, specifically offensively. Offensively, yeah, not defensively. They 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 breed some pretty polished defensive line prospects, but offensively, you have not seen guys come out with a ton of polish or a ton of production. Sure. Um, this one is the second question. My brother and I have this debate, and I would like you all to weigh in on it. Um, it's about the CeeDee Lamb pick for the Cowboys. He says that the Lamb pick was a horrible pick considering the team needs in the secondary. I agree that the Cowboys need help on the secondary, but CeeDee Lamb and Trayvon Diggs is better for the Cowboys than, say, Jeff Gladney and the other DB taken after CeeDee Lamb and Trayvon Diggs. What do you all think? Should the Cowboys have taken a DB slash secondary over CeeDee Lamb? Perfect question to end on and tease next week because we're going to do free agency next week. Free agency is for need. The draft is for value. Free agency is where you fill out your roster with the holes that you have and try to plug them. The draft is to get very good players that can be cornerstone pieces for your franchise because the draft is a long-term decision. Free agency is oftentimes a short-term decision. 
So C.D. Lamb was a fantastic pick because the value there is incredible. You don't get talent like C.D. Lamb at the wide receiver position. The last time a guy like that talented, like it had been five plus years since you saw a loaded a wide receiver class that loaded to where guys as talented as C.D. Lamb fall to pick 17. Think back to that year where Corey Davis goes fifth overall. C.D. Lamb was a better prospect than Corey Davis by a margin. And Corey Davis goes fifth overall. Like, C.D. Lamb was capable of going that high if there was no other wide receivers in that class and the wide receiver, there was a strong wide receiver need in the top 10. So draft for value. And at pick 17, C.D. Lamb's incredible value, not for need. That's Man, how that, and they said. You would have gotten Jeff Gladney. I, I, I'm, gotten, I find it wild that there's even a debate about the C.D. Lamb pick now. Like, seeing how successful he was in year one, like, I'd be like, oh, yeah. man, if I thought at the time they should have gotten cornerback, sure. But now it's like, this was a good pick. This was value. And I think we talked about C.D. Lamb pick as soon as it happened. This is how you should draft. This is drafting value over positional need. And we, we bang that table all Damon the time. Damon Arnett was the next cornerback off the board. There you go. You want Damon Arnett. And you know what the Raiders did at that point? For some need. For some need. For some need. Well, rather than taking best best value or whatever it was. But um, good question from Joey there. That's going to do it for the mailbag episode. Mike, we talked before the recording. We're going to have to record like a two-hour episode or something. Yeah, that got we us are, through January 29th. Almost. Yeah, we're still on January 29th. And there have been a ton of mailbag questions between now and February 18th. Like, we need to make some moves. Quinn, we might have to come in on a Saturday or something. Like, we might, we might, we have to get to these questions. Special. So we're going to try and record either a bonus mailbag or a two-hour mailbag, something along those lines um, to get to these. But we got a break here and jump now to the interviews. I got a ton of them. Benjamin St. Juiced, Levi Muzurike, and Brevin Jordan to finish the mailbag episode. Let's get it. Joining the 2 for 1 Drafts podcast is former Minnesota cornerback and senior bowl standout, uh, Benjamin St. Juice. Is it Juice or Just? Uh, juice. Yeah, juice. Juice. I thought it was Juice. I, I, I'm glad I got that one right off the bat. But it's great to have you on the podcast, man. How are you doing? Doing great. Doing great. Thank you for having me. Let's start at the Senior Bowl. You know, you had obviously a really good performance in the one-on-ones, even stood out in the game as well. What was your mindset going into that week, and, and what did you really gain from that experience down there in Mobile? Well, it all started like I got the late invite. You know, I was uh, mm-hmm. really about to go to the Hula Bowl like a couple of days before that. All my stuff was packed to go to the Hula Bowl, and I got a late last minute call by Jim Nagy um, to go to the Senior Bowl. So I kind of had that little chip on my shoulder to be like, you know what? I think I deserved that invite a little bit earlier. So I was about to go out there and really show, like, you know, that I really deserved that invite, and I was going to be one of those top performers. But uh, besides that, like I was just, I was just happy to be around guys that like, you know, high level, compete with other guys, uh, be around the Miami Dolphins and Panthers staff, and learn as much as possible and get better every day. And I think that's what I, that's what I did, and that's it, it came out, it came out well. The, the result were well, were good. What was some of the feedback that you received, both positive and negative, from the Dolphins and Panthers coaching staff down there at the Senior Bowl? Uh, a lot of positive was that a lot of people were impressed off how good I, I was as a for a tall corner. You know, I did they, like they knew I, they heard about me from like Minnesota, but they were like, okay, like, he's better than, than we expect, and he's more versatile because I played I played safety during the week. Like I never played safety, but they put me there and I did well also. And um, just things to work on that uh, that I know that I'm still working on that, that they mentioned a lot during the week is just uh, being consistent at the line. You know, I'm tall, I got long arms. Like consistently use your arm and disrupt the route with receiver. That's that's how I'm going to be like as productive as productive as, productive as possible. So. And I know at the Senior Bowl, I think, and you showed up late, so maybe you didn't have this opportunity. But a lot of the guys were meeting with NFL teams via Zoom. Did you did you go through any of those conversations? Meet with any teams down there? I actually had the chance to meet uh, with all 32 in person. So we had. Oh two- wow. Yeah, we had two sessions of, of meetings with uh with plexiglass in a in a big uh room at the senior bowl and stuff. So we had fifteen minutes with every single team, NFL team, and uh yeah, that, that was great. That was great. Some speed dating. I think uh who did I have? I had another prospect who was at the senior bowl called it kind of like speed dating where you're meeting with every team for fifteen minutes. But some of those common questions are what? Like why do you love football? What were some of the questions that you asked? Well, there were certain teams that were just asking, you know, asking like the general question, where you're from and how you grew up and all that stuff and where you plan on uh, and all that stuff. Certain teams would like dig them more. Uh, you know, they had like, you know, maybe uh, some people in person and on the Zoom, you know, talk to some guys like the GM or whatever that was there. And then, uh, you know, some of the teams had me draw some defensive schemes on the board. Oh, wow. And, you know, watch some tape and like what happened here and all that stuff. So it depends. You know, certain teams came. Uh, with more uh, detailed approach and some other people are just, you know, general questions and stuff. Who were some of the toughest receivers to go up against at the Senior Bowl? I know Demetric Felton, the UCLA running back, wide receiver, was a good one, and you had some good reps against him, but there are a lot of talented receivers there at the Senior Bowl. Yeah, yeah, definitely got to give it up. 
Um, from the other side, from the other team, I think with yeah, the American team, we didn't really see um, – that big of a competition. Obviously, there were some good guys, but we didn't really see like that many competition. I don't know. Maybe it's because our defense were so ready for that game and all that stuff. But on our side, during practice, where I got a little bit more reps, I would say Nico Collins is a really good receiver. He's uh, 6'4", uh, one of my uh, you know, ex teammates at Michigan, and he got really good. He's really quick and fast. And um, uh, Kay Johnson from South Dakota State was an underrated guy. Uh, I mean, I think he caught every single like football in the one on ones and stuff. And uh, who else was uh, was pretty solid? That's Chris Patrick also came out like you know one of those standouts during the game was really good. So yeah, those three those three were pretty solid. Yeah, I mean, uh, Kate Johnson is one of my co-hosts, one of his favorite you know receivers in this class. I think he's definitely going underrated right now, the South Dakota State kid. Let's talk more about your background. Obviously, you originally committed to Michigan. I think you had two scholarship offers or in that range when you yeah. were coming out of Montreal, I think in 2017 from Michigan to Virginia Tech. You commit to Michigan um, and, and play there to start, but then transfer to Minnesota. Talk to me about that decision to originally commit to Michigan and then obviously your transfer decision to Minnesota. Yeah, well, Michigan was first team uh, back in 2015. Was the first team to give me a, a scholarship, give me a chance. You know, young kid from Montreal, Canada, I had to drive down 10, 11 hours to go do a football camp in Michigan. Uh, that was Coach Harbaugh's first year. He gave me a scholarship, and they recruited me hard at like ever since like two and a half years while I was in high school. And uh, it's a great school. It's, it's, an, it's an amazing school uh, for academics, and it's a great school for football. So I felt like it was the best of both worlds. So I picked that. And then uh, went there, went well my freshman year and sophomore, you know, uh, like an injury happened, you know how it is like in, in college, you know, injury happened and it doesn't heal properly and kind of like the relationship with the coaches kind of like, you know, fell off and stuff like that. So, it's you know, you just get a like a little like a, um, a little sign that it's time to move on, you know, they moved mm -hmm. on, you recruiting class, new guys, and I just, you know, got my degree uh, from Michigan and, and I moved on to Minnesota. Yeah, I think it was obviously a great decision this past year, though you didn't get to play in a ton of games. I think it was, what, like five total games this past year because of the Big Ten and COVID-19 impacting that season, but still a good decision to go to uh, Minnesota. The other thing was that I, I noticed in your background is that your first love was hockey. What position mm -hmm. did you play in hockey? And talk to me about some of the success you had there. Uh, yeah, I started on defense, started on defense because, uh, I don't know, I kind of still had that football type of mentality and stuff, but then I moved, moved to, like, left forward and a little bit, uh, playing until I was 14. I played a lot. At the, I mean, obviously, I mean, we're in Canada, so like every corner of the street, there's a, there's a ice, ice ring and there's an arena that you can play and all the friends were there, all the people from all the high school were there playing and stuff like that. So played a lot of hockey until I was 14. So that, that I think is, is really impressive because I know hockey is not something that you see common. You know, you talk to a lot of two sport, three sport athletes going into the draft. They play basketball or ran track, or whatever. Actually playing hockey, that's a different level of coordination and athleticism for sure. Looking back at your season at Minnesota, what were some? Who were some of the receivers that you went against that season, either in, you know this past year or even before that in the Big Ten that you feel like gave you some of that tough competition? Yeah, I would say in 2019, uh, KJ Hamler was one of one of those guys. You know, that was a, a, a really good playmaker, fast, quick. They knew how to use him. You know, they didn't just leave him out there as a wide out, bring him out, bring him in the slot, motion him in the back and all that stuff. So that was a good week of preparation. They're like trying to shut him down. But he's a really good player, and like this year. I didn't really go against like, uh, you know, elite receivers that I really had to prepare like that. Obviously I had to prepare, but it wasn't like that elite receiver. So I would say my, my, uh, my day to day, like that competition was Rashad Bateman, my, mm -hmm. my team, you know, he's, uh, he's, you know, first rounder, like really good, like big time receiver of the year in 2019. So, um, we always try to go at it and practice and trying to get better each other with each other. What makes Rashad Bateman so great? Cause there are a lot of people that are doubting Rashad Bateman's ability. I saw Mel Kuyper of ESPN have him at eight among his receiver rankings, not even in the first round. Well, PFF is really high on Bateman, really sees him as this polished route runner. I think he's in the top 20 of our board. What makes Bateman so great? Why are people overthinking this kid? I don't know. What's the doubt? Cause I'm confused also. Like <laughs> what are they saying? What are they saying? Well, I mean, Rashad Bateman's not considered a first rounder by everyone. You know, I think ESPN's Mel Kuyper doesn't see him as a first rounder. I think he's getting left off of first round mocks by a lot of people, even NFL.com. I think the knock on Bateman from what I've read, and, and maybe this is truthful, is just the top speed and the athleticism. Like, he's not a freak like Jalen Waddell. He's not a freak like Jamar Chase. But what he does bring to the table and why PFF is high on Bateman is the polish, the route running, the ball skills, all the stuff that it takes to be a good receiver. Give me your scouting report on Bateman. Man, that's crazy that you say that. A lot of people do say that, but if you see some practice tape, if you see some some games like the Wisconsin game, what are the games? I mean, they're 
I mean, I don't think there's a single corner that could guard like, you know, Bateman. I mean, that's a big time receiver of the, of the year in 2019. He has that top end speed and he's, he's more versatile than some of those players that you just mentioned. I mean, yeah. he started, actually was a, I, I mean, as a freshman, he, he, he started and played, did very well, racked up a lot of yards. And then after that went outside to the X and to the Z and then it, this year went to the slot. And like you said, he can run the whole route tree. He's a polished receiver. So I don't, I, I don't think that top end speed is not really not gonna, is gonna knock him off. Cause I mean, he's a complete receiver. He got great hands. So, um, yeah, that's just my opinion. I mean, they can say whatever they, I went against him every day. So <laughs> I know a little bit more. <laughs> Absolutely, man. The, 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 the Bateman slander stops now. It ends on this podcast. Um, you mentioned about preparing for receivers and I'd be interested to get some more insight on what exactly you're looking at on film in a given game week when you prepare to go against a certain receiver. Cause I I've talked about this a ton, but like the cornerback wide receiver matchup is a chess match in and of itself. You know, it's, 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 you know, really looking at, who you're going against, how you're going to defend against certain releases, how you're going to defend against certain speeds and that type of stuff. What do you look for when your opponent scouting in a given game week? Yeah. So if I go against a great quarterback and a great receiver, I know they're going to have some sort of great communication tendencies. So I'll be looking at uh, their top formation and what route do they run? What concept do they run out of that top formation? See what my receiver is lined up. Is he more inside? What route does he run? Does he still me more outside when he's super wide? Um, what, what route does he run? And usually does he come back inside because he's super wide? Uh, does he switch position? Does he stay at the X or go at the at the slot or the Z? And what different? Those are all different positions, so it'll be different routes. And also after that, that's first and second down. So on third down, what do they run? Usually a quarterback and a receiver, a top receiver, wants to you know connect with each other. So does he run a stick route? Uh, there is there a look back? Is there a sign or something like that? Is there a different alignment? Uh, and then I just study my receiver on its own. I just see if he counts step. Does he count step when he run his route? Where he just dig in and go uh what type of route does he run uh and then i'm just you know trying to break it down dissect is he had good hand is he physical in the run does he want to you know show like because usually you know if it's a run or a pass with a receiver you know he doesn't really want to block you or you yeah. just want to run out so i study all those things so i think tendencies are massive man i think that's definitely the first thing yeah i hear a lot of corners look for even edge defenders looking at offensive tackles this is what i look for i look for tendencies i look for how is he lined up where's his stance all that stuff um how much does that film preparation change in the off season do you watch a ton of film on yourself do you watch film on nfl guys are there any nfl guys that you watch a ton of film of now to kind of like cater your game after a lot, a lot. And uh, I used to do that a lot on my own, but I, I got to give credit to my new position coach uh, at Minnesota. I came in this year, Paul Ains, a uh, super wise guy, a lot of knowledge. And uh, he really te he really taught us how to like, you know, like watch film and how to dissect a whole offense. And even know what everyone around us like was doing. So this year, like it really slowed down the game for me because the offense was breaking out. I knew the run, I, re I knew the backfield set, how many backs they had, how many tight ends, how many receivers. I, and I kind of already knew what the play was going to be because of him, because we watched so much film. And then we also, like you said, uh, we watched some NFL film, you know, every week we pick a corner and watch his technique. You know, it could be Stephon Gilmore, Xavier Howard for his ball skills and all that stuff. Richard Sherman for his, uh, for his cover two, cover three uh, skills and, and all that stuff. So uh, yeah, k uh, kudos to him. And I really appreciate that because uh, it made me a really good, better player in this senior year might have to get him on the podcast sounds like a good guy to watch some film with he's awesome that's 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 very cool insight uh what about on the field you know I, I like to ask this question with corners I think talking trash and playing the mental part of the game is important not everyone does it the same you know some people talk a lot of trash some people are chatting the entire game some people only speak a handful of times what's your approach going against some you know diva receiver types or guys that talk a lot and do you yourself talk a lot of trash in game yeah, so it all depends on who I have. I mean, if he's uh, if he's quiet, you know, I'm, I'm I'm all good with being quiet during the game and just not saying anything and just taking you out the game that way. It'll be a quick, it'll be easy or whatever. And then, I mean, <laughs> it is what it is. If you start talking, then I'm going to start talking with you because, you know what I'm saying, I'm one of those, comp like, you know, I compete, I'm, I'm a kind of competitor. So I'll talk with you. And the crazy thing about me that takes guys a lot of, like that takes receivers out the game is that they could get like a play on me, like a slant or out. And I'll still get up and talk with you and be like, that's good. Like, do it again. Like, I'm saying, try to do it again. <laughs> it can happen. And then and it doesn't happen. They're like, oh, that's crazy. He was talking, he was talking trash and I caught the ball. And now he's still talking trash and I, and I can't catch it, can't, can't catch it. So it's a consistent thing with me. So I, I like it. It adds a little bit of spice to the game. Absolutely. Relentless Benjamin St. Juice. That's awesome. Well, I really appreciate you uh, jumping on the podcast with us and taking the time. And I, I wish you the best of luck moving forward. And, and, and thanks again for everything. No, appreciate it. Appreciate it. Thank you. 
Welcome in to Two Four Drafts. Now with Washington defensive tackle Levi Awuzurike, also a Senior Bowl standout down there in Mobile, living it up in my former my former stomping grounds. You're out there in San Diego, <laughs> Carlsbad. What are you doing out there in San Diego? So we're just training out here on the Exos, right in Carlsbad. Just I mean, shoot, going through what we're going through the combine, getting ready for it. Well, that's canceled now. Yeah. Now it's just prepping for pro days. I've talked to a lot of prospects, Levi, and they, you know, a lot of them working at Exos, either in Dallas, some are working in Phoenix. I think there's even some uh, an Exos location in Florida. You're in the best spot, man. San Diego is definitely the best spot. I would, oh, I would oh, argue yeah. that's that's oh, awesome. Yeah, and so you, you're working towards your pro day, I'm sure, but Exos is also holding something at the back end of February, like a combine. Do you plan to participate in that, or are you just saving up for the pro day? Uh, no, I'm not doing that one. We're we're just gonna all. I think most of us decided just to do the uh, pro day. Gotcha. And when's your pro day? March 3rd. Gotcha. 30th, oh, excuse oh, me. I was about to say, 3rd? I haven't heard them that yeah, early. No. <laughs> who, 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 are some of you, who are some of the guys who are working out there in, in the San Diego location? Yeah, so it's, it's me, Jalen Phillips, Kadarius Tony, uh, Cyrus Tuitele, Austin Folio, uh Osa, Adigizawa. Uh, who else we got here? We got Donnie, Evan, Evan Tyler. Who else? Who's the workout partner? That's what I want to know. Who you lifting with? Who can match you at, at, at each drill? Cyrus. I'm with Cyrus. Cyrus Tuitelli. He's a Fresno State O-lineman. So we got gotcha, man. Me, Very him, cool. and Austin, Jalen, all rolling. So I'm sure you're working, I mean, uh, on all the drills, really. 40, you know, short shuttle, three cone, mm -hmm. all those things. Is there any drill that you're prioritizing yourself, know that you really want to have the best time at? I know um, who was I talking to recently? Um just slipped my mind. Diami Brown's really working the shorter shuttle, really working the three cone. I'm interested to know what drills you're prioritizing or if it's just a mix of everything. Yeah, for me, it's not. I mean, it's not I'm not focusing on one thing as much. It's all they all get the same attention. So just trying to be great in all of them. Just be great, man. I like that. It's good be advice. Uh, <laughs> are you uh, what weight did you play at this past season? And do you have like a new goal weight that you're working toward right now? Well, I opted out this season. But before oh, that's right. That, yeah, of course. Yeah. Before that, I played at 290. So 290 is where I stay at, really. Gotcha. Um, looking ahead to kind of your, what you did at t in 2019 and even what we saw in the Senior Bowl, you played some played some shaded on the center, also three technique. Do you have an idea of where you want to play in the NFL? Has, have NFL teams given you feedback or coaches given you feedback about where you want to play or where you should play in the NFL? Not much feedback. You know, I've heard different things. I heard they like me in the three. They like me in the nose. I've heard everything, and I can play everything. So that's kind of why why we hear all of them. Yeah, talk talk to me about the differences between those positions. For those who don't, you know, realize, you know, zero technique, playing shaded on the center, usually a bigger guy, have to often asked to two gap in that area. While three technique, usually the penetrating defensive tackle, a guy that's you know, mm -hmm. pinning his ears back and getting after the passer on passing downs. What? How does your mindset shift when you're playing those two different positions? Yeah, well, you know, as you as you start from the middle and you go out, there's just probably going to be less people to work work against. So as you're in the nose, you're most likely going to get a double team. Double teams come from somewhere. Whereas if you move out to a three, it's about 50-50. Generally, you'll have that guy one-on-one. -on -one, and then as you move out to a five, it's pretty much 100% one-on-one, -on -one, depending on if there's a tight end to chip you or help block out there. But uh, what was the question you asked again? You no, know, the differences between playing between playing the two, your mindset, how it changes. Oh yeah, and then mindset wise, I mean, for me, my mindset is the same. I'm a fuck up whoever's in front of me. <laughs> so for me, my mindset doesn't really change as much. But strategically, you got to know when that double is coming on the center. You got to know where it's coming from. You got to feel it out so you can be able to get out of there. And then when you move to the three, you have a lot more freedom. So you kind of want to open up your moves a little more, and you can push the pocket more from there. Outside of, you know, fucking up the guy in front of you, what do you feel like separates you in this class? What do you think, like, your key strength is and that differentiator for you among the other defensive tackles in 2021 draft? Yeah, it's two. I think I have the fastest get off and I have the strongest hand. And I think that's two of the best things you need to be a good defensive tackle slash defensive end. Hard to lose with that, man. You got the fast get off and strong hands. That's a, that's a win. I, the other thing I would love to talk about is kind of your pass rush plan. You know, talking to other mm -hmm. pass rushers in this class and even other pass rushers in the NFL, oftentimes you bring up this pass rush plan. What's your primary move? What counter are you working? Some of that comes from film. You know, which move you're going to break out for a certain player, a certain opposition. What goes through your mind when you're setting up a pass rush plan, either pre-snap or even working game film in the week prior? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, yeah, it does start off with uh... – who you're going against and who you're playing. But at the end of the day, if you if you believe in yourself and you know you're a good pass rusher, 
you can hit that move on anybody. It just depends on whether you're hitting that move or the counter to it. So for me, I know, let's say I know I'm going in with a bull pull. My counter has to be something inside. So my counter would be a quick inside or a jab step out in. So it's basically just having a primary move and a counter move. For me, I like to, I don't necessarily base it off who I'm going against because I believe in what I do. And I know, like I said before, I know I'm going <laughs> to fuck somebody up. But uh, yeah, watching film is important seeing if that guy quick sets or, you know, sometimes you can get keys. You can see if they stand up straight ahead, you know, they're doing a quick vertical set. So seeing that stuff is real important to tone in your game. I also want to talk to you about some, some of the players on that Washington defense. I'm talking to Elijah Molden here in a couple hours. Then also wanted to talk about mm -hmm. Joe Tryon, another guy that yeah. is, you know, this kind of freaky build and, and a, lo a lot of potential going into the NFL. So first talk yeah. to me about Tryon and, and practicing with him along the defensive line at Washington. And then also Elijah Molden, a guy that from film, I can guess is a very cerebral player, a very smart dude, guy that really mm -hmm. is instinctive, really watches a ton of film. But I need to hear your scouting report on those guys. Yeah, so for Joe Tryon, workhorse. He's he's like, he's the dog of the field. You know, he's going to get every every one of his pass rushes are going to be 100%. Uh, he's actually the one I work with most. Me, Joe Tryon, and Josiah Bronson, we kind of threw out this offseason. Or when COVID hit, we were all working together, just mm -hmm. honing our pass rush day in, day out. And Joe and Josiah were one of the guys who, like, didn't miss days, you know, continually working. So, for Joe, he's gonna be a beast. He has a he has a crazy arsenal of pass rush moves, and then he's so long. I don't I know I don't know if you've seen him now. Dude is big as hell. <laughs> <laughs> he's just been working his ass off, but he's so long and nice with his hands that he basically he just he creates any pass rush move he he wants. And then I know I know Joe's working on a lot of bend too. As long as he is like learning that bend, which he's naturally already had, but just getting better at it, it's gonna be huge for him. And so I've talked to, you know, Greg Rousseau is another guy that opted out the 2020 season and mm -hmm. he feels like he's in the best shape of his life, you know, cause you spent the yeah. entire season just working out. What were some of the things that you were doing? What was like a typical, typical day or a typical week opting out and not playing football at Washington, but rather just working out a ton? Yeah, it was, it was, a uh, it was a little weird cause you know, all your life during this time you're playing the game, but you know, it's all about a mindset switch. I just decided, you know, this is off season mindset. You know, it's not nothing we ever done before. You know, once the season's over, we go into off season and we grind it from there. So, you know, I just started that a little earlier. I started that three months earlier. I had to switch the mindset and then get to work from there. Did you watch a ton of film in the off season, whether film on yourself or film on NFL mm -hmm. guys and like trying to emulate your game off some guys? Yeah. So I try to, I tried to keep the same, uh, what's it called? Like, Routine. I wasn't playing football, but I was trying to keep the same football routine. So I was watching film. I would even watch film uh, when the guys were going to play their teams or whoever they're playing. I just watched film just to, you know, kind of stay in the game in that way. Are, are there some NFL guys at, at your position that you watch a ton of or like want to <clears throat> emulate your game after? Yeah, I think uh, more specific to me, I watched Gerald McCoy and Chris Jones. And then, you know, if I want to do some sweet shit, Obviously, I'm going to watch Aaron Donald. So. Yeah, yeah. That's usually everyone's answer. It's like, yeah, if I want to watch an absolute freak, I'll turn on Aaron Donald. But something a little bit <laughs> – something more realistic, I'll watch some of these other talented guys. But, like, Aaron Donald's like a rare breed. It's like watching a yeah. unicorn. It's like, yeah, I'll try and do that in the NFL. Maybe not. Um, exactly. One to finish with this, man. I think it's – it's. I, I like this question a lot, and I'm sure – at the Senior Bowl, I've heard about it from multiple prospects. You guys did this, like, speed dating thing where you had 15 minutes with every single team. They asked you, like, all uh -huh. these questions. But tell, you know, everyone listening now why you love football, why you want to play this game, and what you bring to the NFL. I love football. Truly, it's because, like, there's no there's no other place you can put your hand down and just put your head in somebody's chin and fuck them up right off the bat and repeatedly mm -hmm. do that through the game. So I love the violence of the game. I love the physicality of the game. Then at the end of the day, it's a great opportunity to take care of your family. And then, like, it's a dream. Growing up, like, I was watching football. I was watching NFL. I was watching college. So it's, like, it's a great opportunity, and it's a dream come true to be, be in this process right now. Fantastic stuff, Levi. I really appreciate you coming on the podcast, and I wish you the best of luck moving forward. Yes, sir. I appreciate you, my man. Joining the 2 for 1 Drafts podcast is former Miami, Florida tight end Brevin Jordan, athletic specimen, man. Former four-star dad played in the NFL. And, like, you wear the number nine. Some people are thinking you're a wide receiver. Six foot three, 245 is what you're listed at. You do a lot for Miami or did a lot for Miami and kind of come into the NFL or the NFL draft as this weapon, this versatile chess piece that a lot of people are excited about. It's great to have you on the podcast, man. Appreciate you for having me. 
Let's let's first talk about the versatility because I think that's going to be a common theme in the interviews you do have, and and really just like the not the feedback, but the attention you're going to get is because I think people see you as this move tight end in the NFL, where how Evan Ingram is used, how Kittle is used at times. Travis Kelsey plays like over 100 snaps at outside receiver every single year, and he's a little bit of a bigger guy. But what is your opinion of this kind of chess piece role in the NFL, playing multiple positions, playing in the slot, playing outside, all that stuff? I think it's great. You know, it really it really optimizes, you know, guys like me. You know, I'm not the biggest tight end, so it really, you know, gets me open and, and you know, play, putting me outside, putting me on the inside, putting me in the backfield. It just allows my versatility to just go out there and make plays, and that's what I do best, just go out there and make plays. I'm a playmaker. So one of the biggest strengths – in your game, and this is written in PFF's draft guide, is your yak ability. And I think you've seen how the NFL has changed for the tight end position. The best tight ends in the NFL, Travis Kelsey, Kittle, Darren Waller, they all make plays after the catch. Do you feel like that's also a big strength in your game? Do you feel like that separates you in this class, the ability oh, yeah. to make plays after the catch? Sure, for sure. That's one thing I pride, pride myself on is my yak. You know, I, I always played really running back growing up. I was a running back my whole life. Then I got to high school and they moved me to tight end. So it was really – just one of the things where I took the running back skill set and just added it to the tight end skill set. So my yak abilities, that's what I could pride myself on pretty much. Running back in high school, man. We might have to get you some snaps in the NFL. Get in the backfield, dude. We can hey, use a bigger back hey, here. Hey, no cap. <laughs> <laughs> I'm ready to see it, dude. I'm ready to see it. Have you had any conversations with NFL teams yet, whether it's Zoom or whatever, about what you want to play in the NFL or where they see you fitting in in the NFL from a positional standpoint? No, most most of the teams that I've talked to, they they really just tell me the same thing that everybody else says. I'm going to move tight end. I'm going to be a guy that's going to be all over the field just playing in every spot. So, I mean, that's that's my role. That's what I want to play. I mean, it makes sense, man. I think that definitely fits your skill set to a T. I think the other thing I want to bring up, too, with your game is that you know, blocking is so important in the NFL. And if, like, for the tight end position, the biggest reason for it, you know, it's utilization to get back to, like, the scheme of it is to bring in a guy that the defense has to respect from a blocking perspective so they come in with heavier personnel, match them up with linebackers and safeties rather than bringing in corners. Where do you think you can improve as a blocker, and how much do you value that this offseason and, and all of that stuff? Are you, like, prioritizing being a legitimate dual threat tight end, being this blocking type and also being, you know, this yak move tight end? Oh no, yeah, I'm prioritizing blocking just as much as route running. So I have I have two coaches. I have a receivers coach right now and a lineman coach, and I do nice. both of them times a week. So I'm blocking is just as important to me as receiving because it it's a great feeling, you know, when you score a touchdown, fifty yard touchdown or whatever. But it's a great feeling too when you make a lead blocking your running back hits the hole for fifty yards. Like that's just a great feeling. So blocking is just as important, and I have to carry that skill set definitely into the, the NFL. And the biggest thing I want to improve on for me is I wouldn't because a lot of people try to tell me I'm not the biggest, the greatest blocker, but blocking to me is all about, you know, your tenacity, you know, your effort. So if you're giving your effort and you're just throwing your body out there, then you're going to, you're going to move a guy one or two yards, even if your technique's not the cleanest. So for me, that's my biggest emphasis going into this off season is really cleaning up my, my technique and making sure I put my hand, my hand placement inside. Yeah. Control what you control, you know, throw an effort, throw in tenacity, all that stuff's going to be huge. And then if you master that technique, have, help with leverage, put yourself in the right position, it, it's going to be, you know, a huge step forward. How much did you play at? What was your weight that you played at this past season? Oh, I was like 248, 249. I was a little bit near two more. So to towards 250. Well, that's big, man. I mean, I know, you know, people, you know, teams definitely look at the tight end position, trying to get to that 245, 250 range. So I think that's a that's that's a good weight for you. Is that the goal weight you have for yourself going into the NFL? Yeah, the goal the goal weight is around like 247, 248. I don't want to be no higher than 250 though. And, and then working out with Phase One there in Las Vegas, are you setting any goal times for certain drills? What drills are you working towards mostly? I'd, I'd be interested to know that. Uh, so the main the main we're, we're we're working on all the drills, but the main drill for me that I'm focused on is the 40. The 40 is where I think I'm going to make my money, and I'm. The goal is four five, and I'm close to it right now. But That's the goal awesome, is on pro day. Appreciate four five, it. dude. I like when's your, when's your pro day? March 29th. Forty is where everyone makes their money. It's where I make my money at PFF. Actually, in my interview, they asked me to run a forty. I ran in the four threes though, so I don't know if you can keep <laughs> up. We'll see it. We'll see how it goes. We'll see how it goes. Um, another thing I wanted to ask you, and I ask a lot of prospects this, but how much do you involve film study in your preparation and game weeks? You know, I think what are you looking for at the tight end position? How much of the opponent are you watching? Opposing players and opposing defenses, and also how much of yourself are you watching? How much self scouting do you do in a given game week? So when we do, when I do uh, scouting, I don't during the week on my opponent. I don't really watch myself because you're not you're not focused on yourself. You're focused mm -hmm. on your opponent playing tight end. I'm 
literally looking at the linebackers. I'm looking at the defensive ends. There's plays where I have to go and block the uh, nose tackles. So I'm looking at the nose tackles, the corners, the safeties. I'm literally looking at pretty much everybody on the field. Well, what's their tendencies? How do they backpedal? What's the what's their first step when they backpedal? Are they flat footed? Is their defensive ends? Do they use their hands when they strike? Or do they come out uh, flat footed? Like it, it all just really co- goes around their tendencies and just looking at every player that I have to go against. And then how does that shift in the off season? Do you like to watch more film on yourself then? Or do you even watch like NFL players or other college players that you kind of aspire yeah. to? In the off season, it's more so watching other guys. So for me, like I watch a lot of uh, George Kittle and I watch a lot of Travis Kelsey, obviously because of the two best guys in the league right now. And then for me, a lot of people don't might not like it, but I watch a lot of Aaron Hernandez too when he played with New England because he was just he was just a bad dude when he played with New England. His the way he ran the ball, he way he caught the ball, he way he blocked his tenacity, everything. So I watch a lot of in the off season more so NFL guys. Yeah, I mean Aaron Hernandez. I know that the off field is obviously insane, but like him when he was playing on the field, one of the best tight ends in the NFL. I mean they had the two best in Gronkowski and Aaron Hernandez. Miami has turned out some good tight ends too, man. This is like. No, tight end you in some ways. You obviously had like you know, Jimmy Graham. Go back to like who? Um, Greg Olson. Clive Clive Wolford was fantastic in Miami. You're kind of in that next line of talented Miami tight ends coming out, man. You got to represent. You're going to have to kind of show up to play here. What would you say going into the NFL? Like set some goals for yourself in the NFL. What are you looking to most prove in the NFL? What do you want to show about Brevin Jordan when you get to the big league? Uh, I mean, there's not really I want to show. But I want to just nah, – there's not really – I want to – there's not, like, a goal I have really set that's, like, I want to do this to that. But I want to just go in and win games and be a contributor. That's that's the main thing because I hate losing. That's I hate losing. It's the worst feeling ever. And, like, just going in and just being able to contribute, that's 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 the biggest thing for me. Do you compare yourself to any, you know, skill sets in the NFL, any tight ends in the NFL that you feel like your game kind of mirrors how they're used or what they do in, in the league? I don't really compare myself to anybody, but when I watch Travis Kelsey, his wiggle when he gets the ball, it, he's, he's just wiggly. He just has a different type of bend to him. So I, I like a lot of Travis Kelsey for sure. All right, we've had a handful. I want to finish with this. We've had a handful of Miami guys on the podcast, specifically Greg Rousseau. Talk to him a couple times. I got to get your scouting report on Greg Rousseau. You've seen this guy in practice. Obviously, he didn't participate in the 2020 season, but in 2019 was a freak in his own right. What are the strengths, weaknesses for Greg Rousseau? <sighs> Greg is a problem. I used to block Greg. I had to block Greg every day. That's, I, I assumed that's, you did. That's why I wanted yeah. to ask you. I was like, I'm I sure this guy had to block him. So blocking Greg was a problem. He He's like 6'8", six, 6'7", six, and he's like 260. So, like, he's just – overall, he's a freak specimen. And then not only that, he's really athletic. Like, in high school, he played high school receiver and, like, safety. Like, he's not a natural dance. And when he goes out there and he really – just plays, just being a true athlete, it's scary. But when Greg really, when Greg gets to the NFL and he really learns the true ins and outs of playing defensive end, like, oh my, it's going to be bad news because Greg is a problem. He's a problem. How, how does he compare to Jalen Phillips? Because, I mean, that's another guy Jaylen in his Phillips. own right who's like a freak, dude, like former five-star. They're, <laughs> they're both problems. I used to block, I used to block him, Jalen, and Quincy all the time in practice. So it was like I was getting the best of really of, of all three worlds because Quincy's a little bit shorter. He's a little bit more condensed, but he's – very good with his hands. He's very technical with his hands. So I then blocking Jalen Phillips. Jalen's just a a dog. Jalen's 6'5", 260, same, same, really built just like Greg, but a little bit more muscular and fast. Jalen, I think Jalen's going to go to the combine run a 4-4. Like Jalen's freakishly fast. He used to run with the skills since I practiced. He's, they're, they're, they're all dogs in their own little way. Dude, different breeds down there at Miami, Florida. Brevin, this has been fantastic. I really appreciate you jumping on. I wish you the best of luck moving forward. Thank you, my man. I appreciate it.